Um, we have two very dysfunctional, harrowing, torturous marriages that we're going to discuss. And for added light relief, we're going to start with Jayashree Misra's book, A House for Mr. Misra. This is the one we're going to start with. But Jayashree too has written uh, a, a book on this other topic, which we will bring in later. If there's time, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, I'm sure there will be. So, so th this one to begin with, and then we go on to the secret diary of Kasturba, um, uh, the wife of Gandhi, and things seen through her eyes and through her mind. So, so imagined, Nilima, but, but not really imagined. Um, it's all historical fact that you have then fleshed out. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Huh? <coughs> and then, of course, we have. Meena Kandasamy's When I Hit You. And gosh, what a book. I, you know, I, there were times I just had to keep putting this book down. It was just too painful to read. And then you, your compulsive reading, you'd have to pick it up again and start reading. But I'm going to start with Jayashree, first of all. Jayashree, this was an absolute joy to read. It was light. It floated six inches off the ground. Do you know? And it's that style. It's a very, very sort of uplifting style. It's the sort of book that you'd like to put down and go back to every time you feel sad, you want to read a few pages of this. I'm so it, pleased to it, hear you in particular. Oh, no, 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 no I really. the kind of books you write uh, are joyful. Uh, but, but there's another reason why I like this book, because in my other secret life, I'm a builder. And this book is about a couple, Jayashree and Mr. Misra, <laughs> who spent two years, was it two years or longer, finally? Thereabouts, yeah. Two thereabouts, years. thereabouts. Yeah. thereabouts. <laughs> trying or succeeding finally to build a house uh, in Kerala on the beach. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Why, why did you suddenly up sticks and sell everything and go? If you backtrack about 30 years, and you, that's the book you were referring to that yes. I wrote about, a very an unhappy marriage in Kerala. So I've, I've been, been through the loop as the, well. The, 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 a marriage that I ran away from, actually, in order to marry the first boy I'd been in love with as a teenager. Um, so fast forward, you know, 30 years in time, that husband dragged me back to the Kerala that I'd run away from because he always loved the state. He loved, he's a boy from Delhi, and uh, coastal states have always appealed to him have us immensely. Have yeah. And the sea has always called him for some mystical reason that I've never understood. I hate the sea. I'm terrified <laughs> of it. And I think most Malayalis, people from Kerala, will, will probably agree with the, with, with the yeah, idea yeah, that the sea and, is something and to why, be And why is that, actually? Because I'm, I'm from Sri Lanka. We're surrounded by sea. And we are desperately afraid of the sea. You know, one of the reasons why so many people died in the tsunami is because they didn't know how to swim, and that was because they had never ventured into the I sea. I think that's exactly the point, isn't it? When you are from a coastal community, you are aware of the dangers a lot more than otherwise. The fishermen regularly lose colleagues out there in the, on the high seas. People come to the beach to swim. You know, people get a little bit high having a picnic on this, and they go in, they venture forth thinking that it's, oh, it's just a paddling pool and don't come back. So these stories become sort of everyday occurrences when you live by the sea. Um, so they're more aware of it. And I think there's a much healthier respect for the sea because it is their, it's where it's their working place. The livelihood. It? It's, that's the, their the livelihood. livelihood. This is, yeah, the communities. Most of the people who live along the beach are the fishing communities. And uh, this is, and if, if you go there as a tourist, you have to be very mindful of the fact that that's where people are actually working and earning their daily bread, fish. Um, and be mindful of the hours that they need to keep in order to get, because these are all done with old-fashioned methods, big wooden boats, which can be quite dangerous to swim against, and the nets, the nets which are everywhere. They're all pervading along the coast. How do they look at you turning up in your fancy, uh, in their eyes, fancy sort of lifestyles coming from London? H how were you sort of regarded there? Perceived. I think the, there was definitely suspicion and uh, a certain amount of animosity to start with. Uh, more than anything else, we came across as people with money to build a reasonably nice house, which is something which the, most of the fisher folk would have struggled years and years and years to be able to achieve. So there was all of that. We got, uh, we got pilloried quite a lot, really, by the local. Um, there's something peculiarly Kerala. I don't know whether you have a version of it in Sri Lanka called the Nokukuli. So it's a kind of union that operates in, in every area and that are out there to, um, to, it's a kind of extortion. It can work as an extortion racket. So any and you're seen building as a material that yes, comes yes. has yeah. to be unloaded by those guys. And yeah. if you don't let them unload it, then they can 
actually charge you for standing there and watching you unload it yourself. So there's all this that went on for a long time. But funnily enough, somewhere along the way, they discovered I was a writer. And Kerala being Kerala and being an educated sort of place where by and large people are, are lettered enough to sort of appreciate the fact that, you know, books are written, newspapers, these are all sort of very everyday things, even in a very poor community. Um, there was suddenly this kind of newfound respect. It, it all, all that happened was that a local newspaper did a feature on me and came around to this house to take pictures of me and my husband standing outside the, the construction as it was at the time. And uh, that got published in a Malayalam newspaper. And that made the biggest difference of all. Because suddenly I was someone to be respected, not to be feared. No, not, yeah. I was a fellow human being, a fellow someone struggling against the ways of the world, someone who might actually tell their stories. And, and also, was there some a certain respect for you because you were a writer? I mean, because it is a very lit literate and literary, literary state. literary, yes, yeah. sort of people. That's what they are, very yeah. literary sort of people. And uh, yes, I think that a kind of grudging respect crept in. I shouldn't say grudging, actually. It was literally overnight. Yeah. Things changed, and suddenly we were... We were taken to the bosom. Yeah. Before that, we tried all kinds of little bribes, like building the local temple wall and alongside our own wall. And yeah. None of that was working, working. as much as yeah. this did. Yeah. But, but um, tell me one thing about Kerala. It's quite interesting. You have high rates of suicide there, a very high rate of literacy, and female empowerment is high. So there are lots of things that are sort of very good on that scale. And against that, you have this high rate of suicide or alcoholism is exactly like Sri Lanka. It's a similar, it? similar thing. Now, the question I want to ask you, which we will deal with later, is are the Kerala men any different from the others as a result? Does education make a difference? I would think not, <laughs> in all honesty. Uh, when you say a difference, do you mean in terms in, of... In, in the I, way they respect women or, or, or not, as the case may be? Well, Kerala, it's curious because Kerala is a, remains... A, deeply, deeply conservative society, despite all its education and all its so-called empowerment of women and uh, the matrilineal system, which goes back you know, as long back as one, as one can remember. Despite all of that, there's this deep-seated conservatism that basically makes Kerala a place that doesn't change very much, it doesn't change very fast. If change is coming, it's coming very slowly. I'm sure Meena will have something to say about this yes, as well, I, because I'm we've, sure. we've yeah. actually been on a panel together in Kerala and had to talk about some of this. Yeah. So, uh, it's kind of it depressing, is. really, because you, you think education is the answer to everything and that it will change the world. But then when you find it doesn't quite do that, I, I or, or not fast enough. I was exceedingly struck by that, actually. Yeah. And I've lived two separate lives in Kerala. One is this young, unhappy um, bride, bride in, a, in, a, in a very conservative family. And then much later, you know, a happier journey to Kerala. But even that came, I would say, <coughs> with its set of challenges that, um, you know, some of it to do with Kerala. So when we, was, when we were talking about marriages earlier, I thought, does this illustrate my marriage to my second husband? Or does it illustrate my, my rather problematic marriage to Kerala, <laughs> my country of my birth, <laughs> where I should actually be, you know, feel very uh, much at home and be place that I should be happy to go back to. And I still view some of what I, what greets me, what waits for me there with an element of dread. And it's very difficult to put my finger on exactly what it is. But I think it's largely to do with social expectations that, like I said, persist. If you're a woman and you are Kerala born or you are, you spring from that land, there are certain expectations that are very difficult to shake off, regardless of all your own journeys. How, how often do you go back? Oh, very frequently. My mother lives there. And there's the house there now. And, um, and do you see any change, incremental, any, any little change in, in this? I mean, it's very, it's very slow, obviously, but... It's, it, yeah. yeah, obviously there is. Yeah. But the, I still get emails from girls uh, who are in college. This seems to be largely read by college students for some reason, my yeah. first book. This, this is uh, Jashi's other book, which, which actually is more relevant to this topic that we're going to discuss. Yeah, I know. Uh, Unfortunately, the publishers she, wanted me to talk about this. This is the one that feeds in my unhappy book. Buy them both. Book. Buy them both. <laughs> <laughs> but marriages can be unhappy and happy, so maybe this illustrates yes, it in, in the a... two ends in, of the spectrum. In a reasonable yeah. way. So, okay, we're going to hit the heavy stuff now, so take a deep breath. <laughs> uh, we're here with these two books. Uh, Anilima's and Mina's, two marriages a hundred years apart, equally fraught and equally sad in many ways. I, I'm going to deal with Mina's first. It's, it's, it's a very current book at the moment. It, it's shortlisted, prizes and so on. Um, Mina, I mean, 
Was it as harrowing for you to write this as it is for us to read this? Um, oh, well, uh, I quite don't know what to say because uh, the, I think all writing is difficult, at least for me, because uh, you, especially when you start out as a poet, you spend a lot of time just worrying if you're getting the words right, if you're getting the emotion right, if you're not wasting any words. So I think the fact that, you know, the fact that you actually are so obsessed about craft or about the technicality of how it sounds and reads actually provides a certain kind of distance, distance. From, distance from the fact that uh, and it you, is you are making a book, so you're not, uh, uh, you're not, Yes, in a sense, you're sharing yourself, or you're sharing what you think about these things, but in a sense, it's also like you're producing art there, so there is a huge distance because you have to make something beautiful or, you know, something that moves people, something people can relate with. So you have no time to feel sympathy for yourself or, you know, to be dragged down. Yes, so too. You're already on, like, part two, which is, how, you know, I've moved on, but how do I say this? So, uh, yeah, it, is, it could be difficult, and, but as I'm sure it's very, because um, the thing is that this was not the first book I wrote. So I wrote an early novel before this, in which um, 44 landless uh, Dalit agricultural laborers, largely women and children, are burned to death burned to because death, yeah. they're striking for higher wages. So which is harrowing. I mean, that's colossal, that's immense, that's a tragedy. So in a sense, you could look at yourself in this prison and what happens to you is nothing you know not that i want a hierarchy of victimhood no, no. but, but you obviously but understand that uh, you know things are harrowing to write and i think we live in a difficult world so how do we make sense of it uh, the writer's job i think in a sense is, is a privileged job because you can take this and still make it into something that people can read beyond just the headline you know or bad marriages yes. or well, because it is beautifully dying. written that is one thing it is absolutely beautifully written so, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no but but, but uh, extraordinary book i mean one thing that struck me about both your books neely mine will come to yours in a minute uh, is the fact that in both cases um men the two men in question one of them is uh my favorite yes mahatma gandhi no less uh, they use ideology as a way of controlling their women. Is this, is this a, like a standard thing? I mean, in your case, it, uh, your husband was a teacher. He was a, a, a respected Marxist, shall I say, within inverted commas. He, he was a man of substance in his kind of normal life, in his intellectual life. But he tended to use that in a way to sort of, you know, yeah, put it down. Uh, yeah, but uh, more than just, you know, the autobiographical element of this book, I think one of the things that uh, you continue to witness and which is why, you know, uh, even if we had to put a lot of theory into a book which is like a novel, I thought, no, you should take it to this intellectual dimension as well because what we're having, and which we were talking earlier about Kerala, is a sophisticated bigot, you know what I mean? Like the sophisticated yes. chauvinist, yes, the, the yes. educated, uh, the, the guy who can quote Marx to just his reasons. own philandering, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, Marx had his great journey, but he also had his, uh, you know, the nanny. So, yeah. so it's 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 fine if I do this kind of thing. So it's very important to call out, and and especially this kind of place people. And the other thing is, uh, in a sense, for me, uh, ideology, and I don't think that a lot of people think yeah, it's very anti-left wing in that sense. But I think the problem is uh, you witness the right do this constantly control women, say that you have to be good wives, or you have to be good mothers, or you have to be good, uh, you know, like citizens of, the, of Mother India. So you constantly have a narrative that the right is trying to push. So you believe that the left is not going to have these kind of, you know, control or control, patriarchy. Yes. And of course, they don't have the same one, because obviously they're not saying this is the great Hindu religion, that's why you're expected to behave like this, or good girls don't do this or that. On the contrary, everything is uh, rationalized through, you know, some intellectual argument like, oh, but, uh, oh, you dress like this, this is what, uh, this is how capitalism commodifies you, or you do this, uh, this is what you're doing. So, so basically, everything you do becomes like something that's so violative of the left. Of, of, of yeah. yes. Interestingly, I mean, there, there's a quote here that you've written, a classless, uh, that, that your husband came up with, a classless society will be a nude society. The sexualization of the naked body is a result of market forces. I mean, that's hypocrisy <laughs> at its, at its, yeah, it's, it's extraordinary. I mean, it just took my breath away, you know, when somebody uses that as a means of, of Well, you know? I, I think, um, I think if people, especially now that Me Too is happening, yes. and it's very important we talk about Me Too mm. in the context of marriages, yes. 
and, have a lot and your of book people. is bang on the button. As I think you have loads it. of people, for instance, especially left-wing women who are coming and talking about what's happened to them and about the kind of hypocrisy that they face because one of the things that, you know, Marxist comrades love to say is the fact that, uh, you know, being, uh, you know, the concept of fidelity is a bourgeois construction. So the fact is that a bourgeois marriage, in, this, in a sense, is a, is a kind of sanctioned prostitution. So, uh, you know, basically advancing free sex theories in order to exploit women, you know what I mean? Like, mm. So there is a kind of link to this, and women who have been exploited in this manner by the left are going to exploit. Or, for instance, there's a lot of left uh, organizations which you try to hide, and especially in this country we've had huge amount of you know press coverage on this they would try to hide what's happening to women by saying oh but it's the bourgeois media which is you know taking up these stories of what's happening to women and highlighting them it's against the revolutionary cause so, or why should we go to the state so if women wants to go and take a complaint to the state the question is why does she want to go to the state uh, because the state is a bourgeois state and it's a military state so we should try to do some kind of you know solve this problem within our own ranks which basically means uh, you know, just a token punishment of no sort for the man, but yeah. the woman being ostracized for the rest of yeah. her active political life and actually not even having access to a political life. And I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. calling out ideology is important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, talking of this, this ideology, I mean, there are the classic cases here in, in, in your book, uh, Nilima, The Secret Diary of Kastuba, which actually I was shocked when I read it because I, I, I'm from Sri Lanka. We don't necessarily know as much about Mahatma Gandhi as, as people in India might do. But extraordinary, I mean, was he a saint or was he a monster? He was both. He was both. Although I don't subscribe to the, uh, the opinion that Mahatma Gandhi was a Mahatma. Uh, I deeply revere his social reform, the freedom fighter, the, the philosopher, the scholar, the yogi, everything I deeply revere. But there's another man inside him, the husband and the father, uh, who, is not, who is not Mahatma Gandhi. He's Mohandas the man. And my book deals with Mohandas the man, who very, very few people, a lot of people know about right. him. Yeah. But uh, very few them. people have actually put it down in the book. And like I feel, I, I think I've, I've looked at it from an alternate reality. Because every single moment of uh, Mohandas Gandhi's life is documented in history. Every single frame. Like in 1938 at 6 a.m. he did this. And every single waking and sleeping moment of his is documented. But the other person who is with him in every single frame since the age of 13, for 64 years till she died, is there. She's but a phantom presence. But nobody ever thought of looking at her story. So I've just turned the camera around. I've gone on to the other side. And I have become Kasturba to be able to tell my story. Like, let me give you an instance. Like, like everybody knows that Mahatma Gandhi came. I don't like calling him Mahatma Gandhi. That, <laughs> that Gandhiji came and told her in South Africa at the age of 36 that we are celibate from now. So that was made a huge big thing. And all that thing is recorded. And you know, reams and reams have been written about it. But nobody ever thought that, what did Kasturba think? Think about this. What was her reaction? Was she happy about it? Or did she dance a jig? Or did she hit him on the head <laughs> with the frying pan? And see, so I have basically just turned the lens around. And I like, like you know, there's every narrative has his story and her story and the truth. Well, this is only his story. There's no her story and there's no truth. And sadly, she was illiterate to begin with anyway. She was illiterate, so she, she, uh, but I discovered to my amazement that she had a very highly developed emotional quotient. Had she been a literate person, I mean, I don't think she could have achieved more if she had been literate than what she really, really, today really. in, 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 in her, her lifespan. Her life. And I go to the extent of saying that Gandhi wouldn't have been Mahatma had Kasurba not been in his life. She's the quintessential feminine force that has kept him going. And I'm absolutely convinced of the statement that I'm making, that he would not have been Mahatma had Kasurba not been his wife. Do you think she ever contemplated running away? Oh, no. <laughs> that was unheard no, 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 of, no, no. was it then? Because she was raised in a home where a woman is ingrained from the age when she can start comprehending that your husband is your god. You can never leave him. This is your lot. Live, breathe, die, scream, do what you will, but you cannot leave him. 
And I think the most crucially challenging part of Kasturba's life was this conflict that she had, the torment, you know, the, the, the tearing conflict that was between the father and the children. And uh, as a natural choice of any mother, if I put myself in that situation today, I wouldn't take it for a second. It wouldn't even cross my mind who I have to cross over and be with. My children, obviously. But I don't think she ever contemplated either leaving him and going or allowed her children to prevail upon her to say that you are a tormented wife. She always maintained that veil. Yeah. Uh, talking of leaving, in your case, Jashri, in your first book, you do leave. This one, yeah. Yes. I'm also getting a bit confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I have to switch back and forth. It's a juggling act. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In your case, you, uh, you yeah, do leave. Absolutely. Was that was that difficult? Very. It took a long time. What you know, where I really should have left in the first, uh, should we say? Two months, or maybe even earlier than that. Um, it took ten years. So oh my goodness! It, it, I know. <laughs> I don't know whether I compress it a bit in the book because I would have been embarrassed to even allow that uh, that that idea to be out there. But yeah, it did actually take. It was it was very difficult, and I think it was largely. Um, I mean, I, could, I would lay much of the blame at my own feet because, you know, I was terrified, I was frightened, I wasn't educated. I did all my studying after. I mean, this, this marriage was an arranged marriage that took place when I was 19. In the book, I've made her 18 just for dramatic uh, purposes. purposes. But 19 was still very young and yes. very naive and very mm. stupid. And for all those reasons, I'd found myself in that situation. Um, I thought it was going to keep everybody very happy, <laughs> my family most of all, and then the family that I married into, I thought, oh, delightful, more people to make happy. I was one of those sort of silly people, and it, it took me, for one, a long time to work out that I was not being treated very well. It took the arrival of a child and a child with special needs for that to become even more obvious, and it was really beginning to stare me in the face that I was... I was wasting a lot of time and, you know, the years were passing. So, so what, why couldn't you work that out? Is it because of what Neelima was saying, that, that it's an accepted fact that you are married and that is your lot in life? Did you feel that when, when, when To some extent, married? yes. And then when I did finally open up to my own, to my mother, uh, who's actually an educated woman herself and, and very sensible, very wise, she, her response to me was, is it that bad? I mean, my, I had a cousin who was being beaten up by her husband and she wasn't leaving. She mm. was sort of putting up with it. And that was, that was seen as being quite a saintly sort of thing for, to be doing it. Mina, in your case too, it the same thing. There, there are so many things where you're calling your mother and your father and they're saying, oh, is it as bad as you're making out? Or they, they, they were, were they encouraging you to stay, to stay in the marriage? Uh, yes, it's, uh, yes, it is. And, um, but it's also, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a auto-fictional in the sense that are fictional elements so, my parents yes, are yes. quite different people. Yeah, uh, mildly, but not very, not by far. So, but I think one of the things that worried me was, um, I don't know. I think it's slightly tragic because when you're too young and uh, things happen very quickly in your life, uh, you don't really have the same autonomy as somebody whose life is more anonymous. So, uh, I was married at 26, but I was also in a position where I was slightly more or less public because I had, you know, I would appear on television, but you, also you the fact that yeah, I had written a lot of stuff. So. And I was also like, yeah, politically very involved. So I knew that there would, this kind of, uh, it was re I think that the question is why doesn't she leave is very easy because uh, in some cases leaving is extremely difficult. And of course, this kind of isolation, cutting you from your friends and family, uh, cutting you from you know, those who may support you, be sympathizers to you, monitoring your phone, your email, your computer, and in previous times, who visits you, who doesn't visit you. All of this, uh, yes, does it, it does exist. But I think w what's even more um, interesting or in the larger context is the question of how your story will be framed. Like there are at least a hundred men and women I could have called up, especially men, and said, hey, I'm in trouble, come and rescue me. These were friends. But you know exactly what's going, what will be the stories that, ah, oh, she had this long going affair and this guy came and took her, took away. her away. And then, you know, it's, it is just the sex drive which is working and then the violence is an afterthought, you know what I mean? Like, so the entire story gets, especially for women, and I absolutely have nothing if a woman leaves the marriage because she has a sex drive which is not satisfied within the marriage, you know? Absolute, people should have absolute autonomy to do that kind of thing if they're not happy. But I think that as somebody who was quite well known, I knew that this would be the story that would haunt me. So if I choose to escape on anything other than the parents' house, because if you're an Indian girl, so you, 
the only place you have to go from a marriage is not from a man to man, but man to back to your parents because then it's really bad. And I, I knew that even as a writer, I also, I think at that point of time, I never had this idea that, no, I'm not going to look back on India. I don't care what people say. For me, the fact that I really wanted to be active in political life, in public life, and I knew that m getting my narrative straight was important because if I'm on a stage and telling people, okay, the caste system is bad or you have to do this, you still need to have need a certain have moral your... integrity within the Indian context. People are not like, oh, but she ran away from her husband because she just wanted to have sex with this random guy. And so this woman is now teaching to us what, how we should fight caste. You lose this uh, you lose, legitimacy. You lose that, yeah. And in a sense, you really want to frame your narrative in a way in which, okay, people understand or people know that this is what she did, that is what she did. And I think, I think that, yeah, in a sense, like, yeah, even if you're very, very aware, you also have to plot your escape in the real sense of plotting, you know what I mean? Mm. Like, oh, there has to be, oh, I informed people, people knew about it. I informed those who, you know, like, you know, a larger circle of people. Uh, I talked to others as well. You know, you really have to leave, create this body of evidence, you know? Before, I think the fact yeah. that you're a writer, yeah, also makes you, in a sense, uh, one of the things that doesn't let you leave is also the fact that you're like, you know, lo writers love drama. so. Just want to see how far it will go. Yeah, like somebody, says, somebody says they're really going to kill you. And with and your life like, at risk at the same time. It's like, it's like an embedded journalist of sorts, except that you really are putting your life yeah. at risk or wasting your time away. So, but, you know, but I still think is, this. The thing is, you were already a writer when all of that was happening to you. So you knew at some level maybe that this was going to be material that you could use. Whereas I didn't even know. <laughs> it didn't, didn't go through your right. head. No, that no, is, this would make a great book. That's actually an excerpt there. <laughs> There's, there's uh, like two of the things. One of the things is that when this is happening, and you really are thinking, not that it's happening, but this is going to be a great scene in my book. <laughs> then, you, then you already know that this guy is history. It's history, yes. But, but, you have but, to get rid of him before like, you write the book. Yeah, 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 but what's happening here, all of this is like a set, you know? Yeah. All of this is going to go into the book. So you already transcended the marriage the minute you're in it. But also the fact that I was a writer made it like, you know, my partner would be like, what are you going to do? You're going to write about it? Is that what you're going to do? And yeah, like, yeah. No, but actually that's precisely what I'm going to do about it, you know? And, and in, in all your cases, it was the best revenge. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, I'm not sure. book. No, it's Crucify it's, them. Absolutely not. Absol no, I, no, think, no, not, absolutely, yeah. I think I'm absolutely dignified. I've never named this person. No, absolutely. No, I, I, I think, yeah, I think uh, yeah. you know, you really have to mask people because there are people who are living here. There's like a politician mentioned here. There's my parents yes. mentioned. You yeah. really have to camouflage a lot of identities, you know. Yes. And for instance, I, I didn't live in Kerala at all until I left the marriage. And then I found actually a nice place to, a safe place in the sense Kerala was good for me. But the whole story is set in Kerala for me because I had to invert it just to hide people who are my friends or, you know, anybody to be recognized and where I grew up, which is Tamil Nadu or Chennai. So, yeah, you do this kind of, you know, you want to protect those you love. And I also think that those who have hurt you still like, uh, you know, deserve a kind of... Because for me, it's not about one person, isn't it? There are ma it's many men doing too. it. Yeah, so yeah. I don't name my narrator, who I think I have taken as far as possible uh, universal or, you know, try to remove individual aspects. And it's the same with the man. You want a prototype there. You don't want to to pin, and you know, put needles into just one person. So Well, you mentioned that... that, that I, I would do that with Gandhi, on the other hand. Yeah, well, we were just going to come to Gandhi, because you mentioned at one stage that a woman has every right to leave a man if he doesn't satisfy her. Yeah. I think it's time to hear Neelima on the subject, because that's precisely what Gandhi came and told his wife at one stage. Okay, so before I tell you what Gandhi came and told his wife, I have to tell you that I, I kind of live in an alternate reality. I am a exciting. product of polygamy. My father had six wives, and this was the time before uh, the Hindu Marriage Act was changed or amended in, in the 50s. Before that, it was legal for a man to take as many wives as he wanted. And my mother was his sixth and youngest wife, and I am the fourth child of his sixth wife and one of 18 siblings. And all running simultaneously? All running simultaneously. Gosh. And if anybody's familiar with Delhi, so, this. yes, oh my God, he might have fallen in love with you and married you too. For 10 novels. So, uh, so 10 to, novels, yes. So, so, uh, so just to give you a little bit of perspective, I grew up in a home where there was a, a fractured sense of morality. The law changed in 50, but the attitude and the mindset didn't. didn't. Wives were not allowed to be taken, but they were already there. There was covert uh, permissiveness in the home. And I have to admit, my husband have, must have had a hard time adjusting to me <laughs> when I got married with this wild sense of freedom that I can take as many men as I like, which I couldn't. So I, 
am, I think I'm a bit more tolerant to infidelity than maybe other women are. And I expect the same kind of tolerance to in infidelity return. in, in return. return. <laughs> when I started writing about Kasturba, and uh, I began, see, in any case, the whole, the whole uh, narrative is set in a century before theirs. Yes, it's a hundred years My father's years life oh, yeah, reads years. like a biopic. Every single frame is scandal and sensation. And my first book, which I wrote on my father, which, is <clears throat> which runs concurrent to uh, many ways Gandhi, uh, my father was very close to Gandhi. He funded the Congress movement. He was the pioneer industrialist at the turn of the century. He set up every single industry that you can think of in the 40s. He was the first Indian owner of the Times of India. And he was a close associate of Jinnah. And in fact, there was an unconfirmed rumor that he and Fatima Jinnah were romantically inclined, which I don't believe, because if they were, he would have married her. <laughs> 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 and, <laughs> and my father was the proponent that Jinnah should be made prime minister. And he tried to prevail upon the powers to be, but he was set aside. And there was a huge embroglio between Nehru and my father for obvious reasons. And uh, when I started writing about Kasturba, which I did with great reluctance, and I feel that your subject chooses you, you don't choose the subject. So after having written this flamboyant character story of my father, I thought that Kasturba will be such an insipid book. Who's going to read Kasturba? Until I actually delved into this and I began reading. And the chilling similarities I found between my father and Kasturba and my mother, so much so that reading extracts of my manuscript to my son and my daughter, they're all in their 30s, my son said to me that, Mom, you could well have titled this book Mother Dearest. There's so much similarity between Kasturba and my mother, other than the fact that my mother was highly erudite and she was a poetess and literature and she had been given the Padma Bhushan in 2006. Other than that, my mother and Kasturba virtually led the same kind of lives. So I have lived with them. I can say now with great courage and confidence that I have lived Kasturba's life frame by frame as I have lived my mother's life. Gosh. So my perspective to the voice of Kasturba, it's my thoughts, or let me say it's my language, but it's her thoughts. It's her thoughts. Let's hear some of those thoughts in that Yeah, passage. okay, can I read out one excerpt to you, which yes. is my favorite? Uh, uh, before I read this out, I'll say that there is an element of fiction in this book. So all the facts that I have documented here, I couldn't tamper with them. They're all historically documented facts because I had to build this three-dimensional character, keeping in mind Gandhi's trajectory of his life. So every frame of Gandhi's, I had to visualize Kasturba, get into her soul, which I could do because I'm a psychologist. I don't know how successfully I did that. And, uh, and be able to emote like her. So I wanted to, and basically, fundamentally, I'm a Freudian. It must be something to do with my childhood. So uh, I basically wanted to, Kasturba died in 44. Gandhi was shot in 47. I wanted to keep Kasturba alive when she's watching as a phantom those sexual experiments that Gandhi carried out on celibacy. This extract that I'm going to read to you now is, is the only place in the book. See, the book is in the first person, Kasturba's entries into her diary. This is the part in the only part of the book where Gandhi is talking to Kasturba, the phantom in the fourth zone. And it deals with this, these sexual experiments that he had with his two nieces. I, I think you people may be familiar with that. Please don't try this at home. <laughs> <laughs> so Gandhi's life had a deeply embedded sexual discourse. He was manic about his sexual uh, uh, energy. In the beginning, he was manic about fulfillment. And later on, he was manic about suppression of it, which he called his experiments with truth and celibacy. So here Gandhi is talking to Kasturba. He's a broken and wrecked man. This is just on the eve of independence, where he's realized that his role in the freedom movement is redundant now. The powers don't want him to be around. And uh, also that these sexual experiments had become so public, he'd got a lot of bad press. So I think uh, Nehru and Patel and everybody decided that it's better to keep him away yes. from the limelight. So here we have uh, Gandhi, who's Who's, who's, it's one of the nights where he's sleeping with these two naked women. 
who are both his nieces. I sleep naked and on either side of me in my bed lie Manu and Abha. He's talking to Kasturba, his wife, also disrobed. Our souls intertwined, their breath resonates with mine. Our bodies touch, but they are flung far apart, separated by a vast universe of carnal desires. I make no pretense about this. What is not secret is no sin. And I have endeavored to practice complete restraint and master my carnality. Is this a sin to drift around in pursuit? I'm sorry. Is this a sin to drift along in pursuit of that ever elusive mirage? Help me, Kasur. Don't dismiss it as a diversion of my vitality. My grief and my failures cannot be shared. They cannot be transferred. But please don't call this a barren pursuit of a selfish dream. Not you, Kastur. You must understand. His body racks with uncontrollable sobs. His glazed eyes fix on a crack in the ceiling. I peer into his deep sockets ridden with bloodied veins that throb with pain. I feel his searing torment far greater than a burning flesh wound. His tears dry up on the gaunt and sallow cheeks sucked into the oral cavity of his age-lined face, and his stark body lies crumpled in a heap on the metal charpoy that has become his regular sexual laboratory. I can see him drenched in sweat. Beads of perspiration line the folds of his brow. The two naked women that lie on either side must experience deeply conflicting emotions, but appear to be asleep. For them, the experiment has eradicated the fine line that exists between the spiritual and the sensual, for they have surrendered their personal dilemmas, body and soul, at the feet of their Lord. For, for them, he was like their cult figure. He, they, they just surrendered everything to them, to him. They are totally oblivious of the violently conflicting demons warring inside the mind and body of the magnificent Mahatma who has chosen them to be his bedmates that day in this union of bizarre uncoupling. To be the chosen one is a great elevation in their status. The squabble for that proud privilege erupts each night before his bedtime at the ashram. All the female inmates clamor to be his partners in this experiment but no trace of the tussle shows on the quiet countenance of the two sleeping girls. How could this be a successful test of their celibacy? Is this a two-way street? How can he not think of their feelings in their arousal to test the limits of sexual desires of these craving nubile women who revere and love Mohandas as a superior divine being to whom they have wedded their souls is cruel as it is unholy? Shouldn't someone be monitoring their levels of arousal? Do their stirrings go unnoticed or are they ignored and suppressed because they don't matter? They sleep in his bed because they have succumbed to their irresistible attraction for a man whom the world venerates and adores as a saint. But who they pine for? Bathed in sweat, he turns over and falls asleep. The telltale pool of that felonious wasted life force mocks at him or tending failure of gigantic proportions and sure damnation to hell. Indeed, truth is a good slogan, but confronted in the corridors of reality, it doesn't enlighten, it emasculates. And if stretched to an absurd level of madness, destroys all peace within. I cannot deny that I'm deeply moved by his plight. Again, the, the Hindu Nari comes to fore. But what I can do, what can I do to alleviate his agony? He is doomed to wallow in the failure of his pledge and his mission. And I, I am a helpless specter, devoid of power. I quietly recede into the ether, back to my quintessential haven of death's solitude. Kastur, my beloved, set me free, the agonizing rasps of the anguished and failed emperor of peace have robbed me of mine. <laughs> Okay, we're fast running out of time, so I, I, I would ask Jai Shri to read from her book. Okay, it's, it's a strange jump, jump yes, to Yes, a complete jump, <laughs> a change of tempo and tone. I'm sure our audience will forgive this straight, sudden change in mood. 
but uh, you already know uh, the background to this. And this is, um, as I said, the, bo the book is kind of bookended by the construction of the house and the time it took to, you know, all the various delays in between and so on. But it's largely really about Kerala, this, this very strange place that I spring from. But, um, and someone like Shashi Tharoor, and I think his sister might be in the audience. We all come from this rather weird place, which, which creates uh, good people. Um, this bit is about customer service, which we were, we were really sort of struggling at one level as people from London and people also from Delhi, where the experiences are quite different. So uh, tourists are not exactly coming to Kerala for the customer service. We found that out for ourselves whenever we ate out, increasingly accustomed to being told that this or that was not on the menu. Given the hot climate, the most puzzling of such permanently non-available items was ice, as Malayali seems strangely unacquainted with small cubes of frozen water that in England or America or even in Delhi was brought to your table in massive buckets. Whenever, which was often, Mr. M asked for ice in a Kerala watering hole, we were met with expressions on a procession of waiters' faces that ranged from mystified to baffled to downright antagonistic. It had got so bad that the minute Mr. M uttered the word ice, it triggered a migraine response somewhere deep inside my head. One evening, a new neighborhood restaurant took star rating in our numerous experiences of poor customer service. We'd taken a large group of fr friends and family with us on this occasion. Once we'd settled around a table in the garden, there rose the question of drinks. We knew there would be no point asking for ice or even for beers, as this was not bordering a highway. That's another whole thing about Kerala, but I won't go into all that right now. Merely an unlicensed establishment. Do you have Diet Coke? Mr. M asked. No, sir, was the response. Diet Pepsi? No, sir, only normal Pepsi. Fresh lime soda? No, sir. OK, what do you have then? We can get you fresh lime water, the waiter said decisively. Mr. M was always unwilling to be taken in by assurances of filter water, so he decided to push it. Well, if you can make fresh lime water, surely you can get a couple of bottles of soda from the shop next door and make fresh lime soda, couldn't you? No, sir. Sorry, sir. <laughs> Why not? I started to shift in my seat, aware that from this point we were a hair's breadth away from storming out, friends, family and all, and we hadn't even got around to mentioning the word ice. That familiar old migraine was rearing its head somewhere at the back of my own. I was also keenly conscious that mother and aunt, with various pairs of bad knees and ankles between them, were in no position to do very effective storming. <laughs> Your water is filtered, isn't it? I asked, trying to distract and symbolically using some of said substance to douse the flames that were just about to leap to life. But the waiter, silly man, had no idea that I was at this point in time his best decoy. He ignored me and kept his eyes on Mr. M in an admirable effort at being manful. Sir, there is no one to go to the shop for soda, sir. Mr. M's hackles were by now sky high. OK, how about this? I will go to the shop and use my money to buy a couple of bottles of soda. Then I will bring them back, and you can take them to the kitchen and ask them to make us seven fresh lime sodas. Do you think you can ask them to do that, huh? Everyone at the table jumped a little at the shouted use of each pronoun. The waiter, unused to having seven sets of terrified eyes fixed on him, awaiting his response in breathless anticipation, chose the wisest form of least resistance. He backed down, mumbling, I will go and check, sir. But Mr. M was really into his pronouns now. Check with whom? <laughs> manager, sir. Mr. M was clearly too thirsty to wait for the manager and jumped up to depart for the shop next door. By the time he reappeared, carrying two large liter bottles of soda, the manager was at our table being sweet-talked by various female members of my family. We'd managed to soften him considerably, for as soon as Mr. M came, he accepted the bottles of soda with a charming smile and promised us our drinks in 10 minutes. Pleased with this small victory, Mr. M beamed around the table, accepting all the congratulations. At this point, Uncle joined us, coming straight from the bar at Random Tennis Club in a slightly belligerent state. After Mr. M had narrated our experience, he turned to the waiter who was still hovering, notebook and pencil at the ready. You don't serve hard drinks, Uncle demanded. No, sir. You don't serve soft drinks, Uncle continued. <laughs> now the hapless waiter took refuge in polite silence. Then let me ask you this. What do you serve? Aunt patted Uncle's arm, and as is his wont, he swiftly subsided. Let's order food, she said, using her maternal voice, which always worked to treat on him. My order is very simple, Uncle said. Fish, curry and rice. You have fish, curry and rice? Aunt asked the waiter, though it was only a rhetorical question, as there could be few establishments in Kerala that did not serve fish, curry and rice. 
we have fish curry, madam, but no rice. Sorry, madam. <laughs> rice. Rice we only make at lunchtime. Our friend Rama, probably taking her cue from Mr. M, leapt out of her chair. Then let me come to the kitchen and make some rice for you, she said. <laughs> of course, Rama was pressed back into her chair and the restaurant did eventually come up with the good serving uncle a bowl of steaming rice to accompany his fish curry. But the question remains, why does customer service have to be beaten thus out of a Kerala establishment? I have a long-winded theory about a proud race that has never encountered domination or suffering and therefore does not know how to serve and kowtow and gratify. The Brits never really came to Kerala. But Mr. M has a simpler explanation. Just blame the commies, he says. I don't know what you think about that. <laughs> well, it's wonderful. Thank you. I was just glad that I had a oh. little opportunity, sorry, Ashok, yes. to indicate even in a long-term, settled, happy, let's say happy relationship, there are, there's still a lot of, a lot of Tension. small compassions and small, uh, you know, compromises, compromises that, that are required. And that's, you know, yeah. I know we have much darker, deeper things to talk about, but I was pleased to have the chance to say yes, that. Yes, absolutely, absolutely, because we're just about to dive through. Really, yeah. yeah. Very deep with you, Meena. And Meena says she won't actually read because we're, we're kind of out yeah, of time. Yeah, running out of time. Yeah? So, yeah. Let's just deal with a couple more questions and then we'll throw it open to the audience. We really have only 10 minutes left. Um, what's wrong with South Asian men? <laughs> How's that for a quick question? You know? you realize you're opening yourself up. I am. I'm there as well. Do you notice I'm, I'm the sacrificial goat in the middle here. I'll tell you. Can I answer that? Yes, yes. I think it's repressed sexuality, pretty much. Oh, really? Yeah. I think the reason for such a high rate of crime against women, sexual violence against women, particularly in India, I'm not, I'm not going to make a statement about the whole of South Asia, but it's got to do with sexual repression. But then, by that theory, Gandhi should have been an absolute criminal. He, <laughs> he was, was so repressed sexually. Way. No, first in the first 36 years, no. He wasn't. He wasn't. <laughs> Towards the end of his life. <laughs> yes, yes. But um, um, I, in both your relationships that you describe in your books, uh, uh, the men are obsessed with the infidelity of the woman. Is that, is that uh, uh, like a standard well, thing? Do you well, think? It's, uh, I, can, I can relate that to the first question. Yes. Uh, I don't want to say anything about, you know, typecasting South Asian men, knowing that... Uh, that's the thing that's going to set off a controversy. But on the other hand, I think that in South Asia, especially India where I come from, you have this uh, concept of caste, which means you constantly are looking at how to control women because you have to keep this very oppressive system in place. And the only way you keep this system in place, you know, you, di uh, you divide people spatially, you tell who can take what jobs. You do all of this, you can micromanage uh, society on a great level, but still the only, in a sense, risk factor where cost can be transcended uh, and where it's easily transcended is if people uh, marry across caste. So the tension of keeping the caste system intact makes fathers into, you know, like absolute Hitlers who want to make sure their daughter is with this person or with this person, but, you know, going into a caste marriage. So caste as a paranoia works all through society, making sure that women are like this, women have to behave like this so that there is no inter-caste marriage possible, or, you know, there's no elopement happening. And the same thing that happens once a girl's married as well, because, you know, this paranoia doesn't go away with just marriage. It stays after marriage as well, because, you know, what if she's giving birth to somebody else's child as well, you know, in a sense that all of this, uh, you know, control of women becomes so ingrained in society that people are going to control women, even when there is no, uh, I think, you know, uh, no threat factor. So I think caste, as a, we have to understand, and I, I think it meant, of course, I think this question of repressed sexuality, Gandhi popularized it to such a level that uh, y in our country you have to be a bachelor politician, you know, so in yes. order to show to the people that you're really committed to them. So yeah, I think in the sense that if you are, you know, having relationships with women, even that is a problematic thing because, oh, then he's swayed by women because it's such a bad thing to listen to women, isn't it? Or to even be with women. So I think, yeah, there's a strange fear of women, fear of female sexuality, but also some of it coming from the caste system, some of it coming from traditional roles of what women should do. And, and women's hair. What is this thing about hair? <laughs> Somebody explain to me. Meenima. Ashok, there's an absolutely brutalizing incident which I have written about in my book. Yes, yes. I think I'm fairly shockproof yes. the kind of childhood I've had and the kind of uh, family I was raised in. But this is one incident that actually brutalized me and has haunted me since. Because I feel that a woman's self-worth mine is, is connected to her hair. 
and the day I have a bad hair day, which is like today, if you've noticed, <laughs> I've touched my hair 200 times uh, while we were talking. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's an incident in this. I'll quickly uh, narrate this to you. Um, Gandhi's second son, Manilal, is 20 years old, and they're in Johannesburg at the settlement there. And uh, there's a very austere kind of atmosphere in the settlement. Everybody's meant to do their own work, and the children and all the inmates of the settlement, there's a little review letter that runs through there. So, they have a two-hour entertainment or exercise or thing in the morning. Everybody's given that. So Manilal, the 20-year-old second son of Gandhi, develops an infatuation for one of the other girls in Mith's daughters, a girl called Lalita. And you know how they are at 20. You can imagine they were playing around in the pool and they must have had a little bit of touching and kissing or what have you. Uh, one day while he was, and everybody noticed this, but nobody said anything to him. Uh, one day while he was playing in the water, by mistake, he touched the hair of one of the other girls, mistaking her to be Lalita, the girl who he was having this romantic involvement with. So that girl came out and she was horrified when she saw him and she went charging in to complain about him to Bapu. So uh, Manila knew that that was the end of it. You know, He was like absolutely mortified that he knew something really awful is going to happen. Sure enough, Manilal was summoned after dinner. Gandhi was sitting on the floor on a mattress, two pillows on either side, Lalita on one side and Chanda, the other girl, on the other side. Very grim face Gandhi had. And both these girls were crying. And Manilal enters and Manilal sees that this is now all hell is going to break loose. And he starts crying. So there's this little dialogue which goes on and Gandhi says, oh, I must do penance. You know how he was into self-flagellation. Those days yes. people did it. My mother did it to punish me. Yes. She would stop eating and I would feel so terribly guilty and stuff like that. Emotional blackmail. Emotional blackmail. So he said that I'm going to, you know, have to go into penance and I'm going to fast. And Lalita said, no, you've punished us. Don't. It was my fault. And uh, Chanda says it was my fault. And Mani Lal is crying and he's sitting on the floor and saying that I'm the one to blame and please, please punish me. So Gandhi said, okay, so you tell me what made you sin? And he said, Bapu, it was her hair. I just fell in love with her hair. And he looked at him and he said, so we must nip this in the bud. Get me a pair of scissors. So a pair of scissors was brought right there. And the two young girls of 16 and 17 were just shorn of their locks. He sat there and he <coughs> cut it off. So enter Kasturba after a minute and she sees these three crying children and that hair lying all over and she bundles those two girls out of the room and she turns back and she looks at him and she says, have you forgotten what you were at 20? All you could think of was sex. And that doesn't end there. So Manilal is made to take a vow of celibacy for 12 years as his punishment and he's banished from the ashram. So one of the things, and why I feel hair is so... Uh, concomitant with a woman's identity. It, it's, it's got biblical origins. Women were shorn of their locks. I don't know how many of you have seen Game of Thrones, but there's a very, very brutalizing episode there called Atonement, in which the queen is punished because she has lain, uh, she has an incestuous relationship with her brother. And she's made, uh, she's, she's censured of all her hair, tonsured, and she's made to walk naked down the village with the whole village throwing feces at her. And it doesn't end. In India, we still have it. The Dalit women who are oppressed, who are found uh, guilty of certain frivolous things, are still shorn of their locks and made to walk naked in the village. So I feel that the worst kind of punishment you can do, you are separating her self-worth from her by making her go bald. And then widows were made to shave their head so that every single element of beauty or attract sensuality was taken away from them so that people couldn't, and their own, they, you know, it was meant to, I don't know if it did, but meant to suppress the sexual energy within the woman herself. I think it's actually addressed very well in Meena's book as well. I'm sorry, you're yes, talking about yes. your book, but mm. the mother's fixation on the girl who returns home and then she's got these lice running around in her hair and she goes on and on about that rather than what's actually happened. I think we might be running out of time. Yes. Sorry, questions? Uh, there's just one question. One question. There was, there was a, a hand up there at the back. I'm sorry, we, we had so much to talk about. I do apologize. One question, there. if somebody could. As an outsider looking in, I think um, my view of the Asian, the South Asian man, is what I get from Vikram Seth in A Suitable Boy, or the many, <laughs> or the many writings of our famous Caribbean writer, V.S. Naipaul, yeah. an emotional nomad who was 
disliked by both Indians and West Indians where he was born in equal measure. The question is, how do we have to, do, don't we accept that Islam and modernity, we have to let Islam go through the reformation like it was done in Christianity? And the, 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 the pervasive or kind of um, um, egging on that narrative which by the West is creating that sort of a division within Islam itself. Who would like to take this question? Um, no. we hurry up, sir, please. Uh, Nina? Well, I'm not sure I got the question right, but I think uh, there, there is, of course, an element of you know the Western gaze as well, which is why I refuse to comment and say, oh, it is a problem of South Asian men, because uh, one of the things that I was very afraid of when I write a story of a violent marriage set in India is people are going to say, oh, Asian women getting beaten up, you know? It becomes like a stereotype, and you know it just gets reduced to that. Whereas so much domestic violence may happen in the UK. Two women a week are killed because of intimate partner violence, but you don't talk about it in the same way. And nobody criminalizes British men as being wife beaters or wife killers, you know. So I think this this problem of toxic masculinity is an international problem. You have all these people doing mass shootings in the US, and all of them have had troubles with their yes. wives and girlfriends. So. True. Do we have time for just one more? No, we don't. Ladies and gentlemen, Neelima, Nina, and Jayashree.